Um, hello, everyone here. Um, it's a great honor for me to coordinate this event and host Jennifer as our guest speaker. It's really exciting to have you after reading so many of your insightful papers. So, uh, first, please allow me to uh, briefly introduce Jennifer Locke. Uh, so, Jennifer is an assistant professor of management at Georgetown University's McDonald School of Business. Uh, her work on overconfidence received the 2019 Early Career Award by the Journal of Experimental Psychology. And counter to the well established phenomenon of algorithm aversion, her paper on algorithm appreciation suggests new insights on when people are willing to embrace algorithms and improve the quality of their decisions. So uh, today she will give us a talk about algorithmic hiring. So let's welcome Jennifer and I will give the floor to you now. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm really looking forward to um, discussing this work with especially this group. Um, and I'm really curious to get your thoughts. I'll share um, some work on algorithm appreciation and then focus on algorithmic hiring um, all with the eye towards developing a more overarching theoretical framework, which I call theory of machine. And I think this is a especially great group to get uh, feedback on that theory that I'm starting to build. So thank you so much for having me. I'm interested in how managers can assess themselves in the world more accurately. And as Ming Shen mentioned, the research I'll share today examines if people are willing to listen to algorithmic advice which is important because that can actually help them improve the accuracy of their decisions in many decision contexts. Uh, the second paper that I'll focus on today is how people want their own performance to actually be assessed when they're applying for a role on a team, uh, either by a person or an algorithm. And over the course of conducting this research, I've developed a, a theoretical framework, which I'm really looking forward to getting your thoughts on, theory of machine. I probably don't have to tell it to this crowd, but although historically managers and organizations have received advice from people, really with the rise of big data, more and more organizations are trying to leverage the accuracy of algorithmic advice to inform their managerial decisions. So some use algorithms to hire promising applicants already, this is rising, and some use algorithms to predict performance for current employees, and some to predict who's at risk for leaving in order to improve their, uh, their retention. So the issue here really is that while many organizations are swimming in data and investing in algorithms to sort through that data and produce this new source of advice, Many are really trying to understand how they can fully realize or maximize the benefits of algorithmic advice. So specifically, it's unclear what happens when this algorithmic advice is generated actually gets in the hands of managers and other decision makers. And the second research I'll share today looks at what happens when algorithmic judgment is being assessed by stakeholders. So not the decision maker, but people who are applying for jobs. Um, so first we'll look at how do managers listen um, to algorithmic advice or how do they override it? So we'll go through if people are willing to listen to algorithmic advice. In my algorithm appreciation paper, this is when people were making predictions about the world. So for uncertain events like Brexit and other geopolitical events. Um, and then additionally, how do, how do stakeholders um, actually respond to being assessed themselves either by a person or an algorithm. And this will all lead up to uh, theory of machine. So I'll just plant the seed for you. The idea of theory of machine this is a, um, inspired by a long line of research in both philosophy and psychology um, called theory of mind. So theory of mind looks at how we infer intentions and beliefs in the minds of other people. And I'm looking to develop a theory of machine, which describes lay people's theories about algorithmic judgment and human judgment and how those two compare at their finest. So the importance of understanding how people respond to it, algorithmic advice is really twofold. First, it has potential to greatly improve decision making. Algorithms generally outperform the accuracy of human experts when the two are actually directly compared. And there's a long line of literature on this. And I saw that um, some of your past speakers had, had touched on this as well, which was exciting to see. Second, algorithms can only improve human judgment if people are actually willing to listen 
Um, and so while the field of data analytics or the systematic computation of data, most commonly using algorithms, continues to evolve at a rapid rate, um, the important connection between producing insights and actually applying them is often overlooked. Especially when you start to talk to folks in industry, the people on data analytics teams are just assuming that whatever output they're producing, people are going to follow 100%. But that's not always the case necessarily and deserves empirical testing, I think. So, as I mentioned, the first paper I'll share tests that people are willing to even listen to algorithmic advice in the first place. Um, to give a little bit of background, and I'm, I'm sure most of you know this work pretty well, um, but just so we're all on the same page, really the enormous strength of algorithms in algorithmic accuracy and judgment accuracy has prompted speculation as to how comfortable people are relying on algorithmic advice. So in his classic book on the accuracy of algorithms, which sat on my bookshelf in grad school for many years, um, Neil looked at the accuracy of algorithms rather um, relative to human judgment. And Neil may have made the first academic mention of psychological distrust of algorithms. He described how when he was describing the um, empirical results, comparing accuracy of algorithmic to human judgment, when he shared this work with expert clinicians from the 50s, these expert clinicians were actually really reluctant to believe that a simple mathematical calculation could outperform their own precious judgment. This sentiment is echoed in other research on the accuracy of algorithms that didn't necessarily look at people's perceptions of algorithms. And really what that did is actually really important because it led to conventional wisdom that people just distrust algorithms and that idea survives to this day with limited empirical testing. So I know that Berkeley Dead Forest had visited you folks. He has some great work on this and Nate Fast as well. And there's a lot more work bubbling up on this topic, which is really thrilling. But I think it's useful to know originally the idea of distrusting algorithms really came from anecdotes. And so much so that even in Kahneman's best selling book, Thinking Fast and Slow, this idea of algorithm aversion is very strong. Um, one thing that I want to mention about the first paper I'll talk about um, through our experimental design, we actually eliminate issues that have made some prior empirical uh, results a little bit more difficult to interpret. So some prior research that has looked at actual perceptions rather than just the accuracy of algorithmic versus human judgment um, had looked at choice. So we use a paradigm where we present people with identical advice that helps us control for a lot of factors, including the accuracy of the advice. And we merely manipulate the label of the source. So rather than measuring choice, which a lot of past work has done, we measure how much people update to the advice that they receive based on whether they think it comes from an algorithm or a person. And so a little spoiler alert, instead of finding a version, we find algorithm appreciation, hence the title of our paper. Um, so in this paper, I'm just going to give a brief overview because most of the studies in this paper use this paradigm. We use a methodology called the judge advisor system. It's frequently used to study how much people incorporate the judgments normally of other human beings into one's own judgment. Uh, this paradigm enabled us to measure the percentage that people actually adjust towards the advice from their initial estimate. And you just want to pause here in case anyone has any questions about that. So people make an initial numeric estimate, then they receive advice that's also numeric, and then and they have the opportunity to, to make a final incentivized estimate. So if they updated fully to the advice, that would be a weight on advice of one. If they completely discounted the advice from either the algorithm or other people, that would be a weight on advice of zero. So any questions about that? Great, I'll, I'll keep chugging along unless I, I hear otherwise. So in our first studies, we benchmark what utilization of algorithmic advice looks like relative to utilization of human advice. And it's useful to have this benchmark of how people respond to human advice um, there because uh, there's past work in advice taking literature that people tend to really heavily discount advice from other people. On average, people discount um, advice so heavily that they actually only update 30% to advice when it comes from other people. So we wanted to know, well, how 
uh, controlling for the fact that we know that people tend to just discount advice in general, how do they then respond to advice if it comes from a new source? Across our experiments, we find a really robust effect um, that people consistently give more weight to identical advice when it's labeled as coming from an algorithm than a person. So we call this effect algorithm appreciation, and we find it across a lot of different domains, both objective and subjective domains. So for visual estimates, as well as the most subjective domain we could think of, which is people perception. So will two people um, described in the study get along romantically? And that's the, the judgment that participants were making there. And regardless of the subjectivity of the domain, here we consistently find that people um, rely more on the same advice when they think it comes from the algorithm, which is the um, blue bars here. So it's a pretty robust finding across these studies. Um, and what we wanted to know was after that, well, algorithm aversion seems alive and well in people's thinking from the side of researchers. So we actually, in study two, asked researchers to predict the results from um, our matchmaker study where people were predicting romantic attraction between two people that they'd read about. Some of you may even have taken our survey, which we shared with the judgment and decision-making uh, conference email list. So although our results from studies 1A through 1D may sound intuitive now that you know the results, interestingly, when we asked researchers, they predicted the opposite results to what we found empirically with our participants. They did predict aversion when we actually found um, appreciation. So far, our experiments intentionally controlled for excessive certainty in one's own knowledge. In the studies that I've shown you so far, we provided advice from external advisors, regardless of the source, in both the human and algorithm conditions. Why did we do this? Well, it ensures that participants compare their own judgment with advice in both conditions. So basically, we're not confounding human judgment with someone's own judgment, because in both the human and algorithmic conditions in our past studies, everyone was comparing their own decision with an external advisor. So in experiment three, we basically wanted to know if thinking your special snowflake moderates algorithm appreciation. So let me explain a little bit more here. We examine whether subjective confidence in your own judgment plays a role in the use of algorithmic judgment. Here, people in one condition were choosing before they ever saw, so this is a little different from our judge advisor system paradigm, people were making a choice here before they saw the advice. This allowed us to have one condition where people were choosing between advice that they might receive from another person or from an algorithm. This, we replicate algorithm appreciation where people are making a choice in their advisor prior to getting any information about what their advice might be. So that's consistent with the results that I've shared with you so far. Um, and that 88% shows the algorithm, which is statistically significantly different from 50% if they had merely averaged. So our new condition here is people choosing between an algorithm and their own estimate. And we, we thought, I was thinking that we would actually um, completely do away with algorithm appreciation, but it, it was so strong in the study that it um, moderates algorithm appreciation, the role of the self and your own judgment to make a direct comparison to the algorithm. 66% um, is different from 50%, uh, but the key here is that they're still choosing the algorithm. Um, it's important to note though that 88% is statistically significantly greater than 66%. So we did moderate algorithm appreciation, but we couldn't turn it off fully. And indeed, when we asked participants how confident they were in these estimates before they received them, people were more confident in their own estimate being correct than in that of another person, which is consistent with work on overconfidence. So here, these results suggest the confidence really drove the propensity to choose the human estimate more when the human was the self rather than when the human was an external advisor. This study, I think, is really important because it also partly helps us reconcile our work with um, empirical work that had been coming out at the same time. <laughs> 
And finally, I think my favorite study um, in study four, we collected data from a really unique sample, national security professionals who are arguably experts at forecasting. So we compared this expert sample to a lay sample that made identical judgments. This allowed us to see how objective expertise influences responses to algorithmic advice. And keep in mind, uh, full disclosure, obviously we're comparing two samples that probably differ on more things than just expertise, but we thought it would be useful if we're going to be able to get data. I, it took me two years to actually be able to get our survey circulated to national security professionals, that if we had the chance to get data from experts, to then be able to have a benchmark. So the lay sample serves as a nice benchmark. If you're interested in subjective expertise and how that influences responses to algorithmic advice, I'm happy to talk more offline about that. I ran about 12 studies where we manipulated subjective expertise without manipulating objective expertise or knowledge, which ideally would be key. Um, just a brief summary of that. We were able to manipulate felt expertise in those 12 studies, but people still responded the same uh, where they were relying on algorithmic advice. That basically told me that the advice, the um, expertise that was so strong in our national security professionals, which had been developed over the course of some of them had been in their jobs for 30 years. It's just that it's difficult to replicate that strong sense of expertise online in an experiment that lasts about five minutes. Um, but it's still a topic I'm really interested in. Um, so we compared this expert sample with a lay sample. And here we tested for algorithm appreciation, appreciation in visual estimates, um, business forecasts or how much Tesla would sell, and two geopolitical forecasts about cyber sanctions and Brexit. Um, this allowed us to test for algorithm appreciation in domains of even an extreme uncertainty. Remember how uncertain it was whether or not Brexit would go through um, or not by a certain time. Um, and here, although lay people showed algorithm appreciation as our past samples did, experts actually discounted algorithmic advice more than lay people. So when experts were receiving advice, they just didn't listen to anyone. And then importantly, this ended up hurting their accuracy. Um, so experts discount algorithmic advice more than lay people. And this comes at a detriment to their accuracy. So people who are um, paid for a living to make geopolitical forecasts who are actually making less accurate forecasts than uh, lay, our lay participants, which I always think is very depressing for the world, but fascinating for research. Um, in summary, we did find some interesting moderators. So algorithm appreciation is moderated by two key factors. First, when a decision maker is directly comparing his or her own knowledge to algorithmic advice, algorithm appreciation weakens. And when people have expertise in a domain, our work suggests that they're just going to discount advice regardless of the source, which importantly ends up decreasing their accuracy. Um, and one other kind of tidbit that I always found interesting is we did find um, a mechanism where we tested for numeracy in our participants in earlier studies. And the more numerate people were, the more they were willing to rely on algorithmic advice. Maybe a little bit less surprising than the other moderators, but I think still useful to keep in mind. So numeracy um, was an 11 item scale that basically measures kind of comfort with numbers on simple math um, math questions. I saw in the chat that there might be a question, but hopefully I answered it. It looked like the last message said it was answered. I'll, I'll pause here. I can't see the chat. So if there are any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. Make uh, I can monitor the chat. If there's any question, I can yeah, bring Great. it out to you. Great, thanks. Um, so a lot of you might be thinking about a lot of other moderators of what might kind of flip this effect of algorithm appreciation over to aversion. And I spent 
uh, a lot of years of my dissertation trying to find a strong moderator, but I was just kind of met with really robust effects for algorithm appreciation when people are making predictions about the world. So, so keep that in mind. Um, the decision context is always predictions about what's going on in the world or other people, not necessarily related to themselves. Um, one thing I thought might actually um, be a moderator to algorithm appreciation was familiarity with algorithms themselves. Um, so if people are just uh, aware that they use algorithms all the time, maybe they're just more likely to listen to advice from it uh, relative to people who never really use algorithms or maybe an older generation who doesn't even know what Netflix is, right? Uh, but we actually found, so one proxy for familiarity with algorithms might be age. Uh, we found that older people rely just as much on algorithms as younger people do, which was quite surprising to me. Um, and we did have a wide range of ages in our samples. Um, and another thing I thought might flip this effect is a difference between choosing between, um, you know, within subjects design algorithmic versus human advice, because most of the studies that I ran were um, between subjects. So people were only responding to one source of advice. Um, and there's a, a lot of great work uh, from Max Bazerman and others where they show that there's a difference in psychologically in how people think about uh, choices when they're presented jointly versus separately. And separately would be how I, um, that would map onto the studies I showed you this between subjects design. Even when we looked at choice, 75% of people still chose the algorithm over the person. So again, robust to that. Finally, I thought, what if people just have more control over the um, advice in our studies because they're making the final estimate, right? Um, and I thought, well, what if they have to, when they're choosing um, the advice that they're receiving, they're choosing before they see the advice, that they'll make sure the estimate provided by the advisor that they don't really have any information about is going to determine their final participant payment without them adjusting at all. And even when people were not only outsourcing the, um, the final estimate to the algorithm or person, uh, when that was actually determining their final pay and they couldn't adjust away or towards the advice, 61% still chose the algorithm when the advisor would be in full control and determine the final incentivized outcome. So robust to that as well. One moderator that I thought was kind of interesting, we I ran a study where we changed uh, the labels on the algorithm and the person across a number of cells. And it seems that in scenario studies, uh, people prefer an expert person to an algorithm. And I think that this jives with some work that's been coming out recently. Um, and I think this is pretty interesting because algorithmic advice is often less expensive than expert human advice. You can think of doctors and things like that. Um, and it's also just more readily accessible. So you don't, uh, I think with like video chats with the doctors this past year, maybe that's kind of changing, but generally algorithmic advice has the potential to completely displace advice that we normally would pay experts to give us. Um, so I think that this is kind of a useful um, piece of evidence there. So overall, these results suggest that algorithm aversion is really not such a straightforward story as received wisdom would have us believe. And it partly overturns what a lot of researchers have assumed we've known for over 50 years. But importantly, I think it opens the doors to many questions about how expectations of algorithmic and human judgment at their finest differ from each other. So one aspect of this paper that's useful to keep in mind, which I kind of flagged, was that people are making predictions about the world. Um, romantic attraction between other people, geopolitical events. But I started to wonder, this was my dissertation work, and, and through that I was starting to think, I really want to um, collect new data on what happens when people are in domains where judgments are being made about them. An algorithm and a person is giving, producing judgments about their own performance. So something that's really personal rather than um, making judgments about the world. So that's why I turn to the domain of algorithmic hiring. It's being adopted by many organizations. So Amazon uses um, algorithmic hiring 
in a very widespread way, but every time I talk to uh, Prasad Seti at Google, he tells me that they really don't use algorithms that much in their hiring processes because the engineers just don't want to have that. Um, part of me still can't believe that. Like the engineers don't want algorithms um, to help with promotion decisions, but um, Google has kind of not changed with that for many years. So I wanted to test empirically, how do stakeholders or the job applicants view algorithmic hiring um, compared to being hired by uh, a human manager. Um, so you can imagine here that if people don't want to be hired by an algorithm, when the labor market becomes tighter again um, in the future, they may even forego applying to that job. So I think that this question has some interesting um, applications for the real world that way. So in study one, I'll show you, this is new work that I'm really excited about, so really looking forward to feedback on this. Um, in study one, I'll show you applicants' preference for how they want their application packet reviewed when they're applying for a role on the team. And we created this pretty intricate paradigm where MTurkers were, um, I'll go into the details, but MTurkers basically had the opportunity to take a few tasks, and then they knew that based on their performance on those initial tasks, they could be hired um, to be part of a team to um, solve a um, kind of a puzzle that everyone responded to very strongly. Um, it was basically a murder mystery. And if there's one thing that keeps prolific uh, participants attention, they're very into true crime and they were very excited at the opportunity to become part of the team to potentially solve a murder mystery. Um, so spoiler here, a whopping 70% of applicants in study one chose a person over an algorithm. So this was really the first time that I finally found this algorithm aversion that everyone's kind of been talking about. And that was exciting. And I think part of that is because of the domain um, of the judgment itself and that it's actually about the participants themselves rather than the world. So this effect within hiring appears to be robust, but we do find important factors that weaken and even reverse it. So in study two, we find that aspects of the application pool, the applicant pool itself influence our effect. So preference for the person weakens when competition is higher within the applicant pool, um, but when competition is lower, applicants prefer the person. Um, as more competitors are vying for the role, it seems that this preference weakens. Um, and in study three, we shift to examine how characteristics of the hiring manager themselves actually influence applicants' preferences. Again, applicants do prefer a person over an algorithm when the hiring manager is a member of the in-group, but when the hiring manager is a member of the applicant's out-group, this preference reverses. And here, when the hiring manager is an out-group member, people strongly prefer the algorithm. And one thing, the, the reason why I'm really excited about this project is here we kind of in study four or study three dive into the mechanism. So is it that people think the outgroup member is going to be biased against them? Or as an outgroup member, does the applicant think, oh, well, that person is just not competent enough to see how good of an applicant I truly am? So that's kind of the difference between uh, sis, uh, systematic error versus uh, random error thing that uh, Daniel Kahneman has talked about in some of his writing. Uh, in study four, oh, so what were the in-group and out-group in the study I see in the chat? I'll walk you through in more detail in this paper um, than I did in the first paper. The first paper, I kind of wanted to give you an overview to, to see where I was starting from diving into this. So we'll, we'll go over that in a few slides. Thanks for a good question. In study four, we manipulate the algorithm's past performance. Basically, I wanted to know, like, how good does an algorithm need to be before people want it to assess their performance? How accurate does an algorithm need to be before people actually prefer it to a hiring manager? And so another spoiler here is that an algorithm actually needs 75% accuracy before the preference actually flips. That's a pretty high bar for people to prefer the algorithm, or at least I thought so. I was pretty surprised by that. Um, so in study one, 
Participants read an overview of the study. They knew what they were going to um, be working on in the, the time they were in the study. So they read that there were two tasks and that depending on their performance on this anagram quiz and this trivia quiz, there was a possibility to work as part of a team with other um, participants on task three. Then they read task three and they read it was a murder mystery and they all kind of lost their minds. They, they got pretty excited about this. Uh, so it's just always nice to know when participants are really involved and we know we're getting good data. Uh, here participants have opportunity to win bonus pay from this murder mystery while coordinating with others under time pressure. So you could imagine that most people were pretty incentivized to do as well as they could on the quizzes to create the most um, competitive application packet that they could. And so they took it a little bit more seriously. So then they read that in order to create four teams, active participants would be assigned to roles, with 75% of participants being assigned to the role of applicant to the team and 25% the role of hiring manager. Uh, normally, I try to avoid deception at all costs. I didn't use deception in any of the studies for algorithmic hiring. For this, um, we did use deception uh, because all participants were applicants. And so the survey um, also stopped before task three started. Ideally, um, some of the next studies we'll run will actually have people take the murder mystery and we'll be able to measure people's performance as an extra kind of um, dependent variable there. Um, so after people took the quiz, everyone found out that they actually were an applicant and they read a little bit about what their application packet would look like. So they read a page that said, your application packet will include your quiz scores, including your time spent. So you can imagine if you answered a lot of the trivia questions correctly in a short amount of time, you're feeling pretty good about your performance. Um, the difficulty of correctly answered questions, so you also know a little bit more about how competitive you are, as well as a short essay. So we wanted to have a mix of both objective and pretty subjective criteria. So you can imagine if you have um, an opportunity to write a short essay here, people could use it potentially to persuade. Um, and then they made a choice of who they wanted to review their application packet. So here they wrote their essay and then they made their choice. But in the other studies I'll show you, we actually find the same results if they make their choice and then they write the essay. And they chose, how do you want your application reviewed from a person or an algorithm? We wanted to um, counterbalance that order. We changed the order in the other studies in case here, maybe people thought, well, I'm writing this essay and that would maybe lead them to want to choose the person because they think the person would be more persuaded by the essay. But we still find the same results even if the order is different. So here, 70% of people chose to have the person over the algorithm assess their application packet. Next, we wanted to know, well, is this preference affected by the competition of the applicant pool itself? And you can imagine that, um, especially kind of with COVID and the application pools changing in terms of job loss and things like that, that could easily influence people's decision of whether or not to apply to one role or another, um, depending on how they think they might be assessed to give them um, a more efficient use of their time at a job they think they might be more likely to get. <clears throat> so here we operationalize low competition as four spots available, but there's five other applicants. Um, and in high competition, 21 other applicants. Here we found a moderation that a moderator of competition. So when competition was low, people, um, I should note that the Y axis is the percentage of people choosing the person relative to the algorithm. So more people chose the person in the low competition than the high competition um, condition. <clears throat> and those are both significantly different from 50%, so an indifference point. And then finally, in study three, um, this in-group, out-group will hopefully answer the question someone had before. Um, we wanted to know if people might prefer an algorithm when the hiring manager is a member of 
the out group more. So you can imagine um, a few reasons why people might switch to the algorithm, which I alluded to before. So people report their um, beliefs on hot button political issues, which included minimum wage, gun ownership, and abortion for the study. And then <clears throat> they were told when they found out that they were in the role of the applicant that the hiring manager either agreed with them or disagreed with them. <clears throat> so if they agreed, they were a member of the in-group. If they disagreed, they were a member of the out-group. Um, and here we found that when the uh, hiring manager was a member of the in-group, again, people really prefer to have that person assess their application packet, but it flips and people start to prefer the algorithm when they find out that this person really disagrees with them on hot button political issues. So we ran a follow-up study to this, looking at if this is driven by systematic or random error expectations of that. Systematic error, meaning um, this person will just be biased against me, and random error, um, meaning that I expect their judgments to kind of be all over the place because they're incompetent um, at actually making this assessment. And the way that we did that was we either told people um, explicitly that the hiring manager, a member of your out group, will know that you are a member, you guys are out group members. Or we explicitly said the hiring manager won't have in information on whether or not you are an in group or out group member. And so here we found that expecting the out group member is incompetent drives this uh, moderation rather than being biased against them. So basically, we find that people want the algorithm even when the out group hiring manager is not going to know or have any idea about the identification being different. So you just think that they're not good at making these judgments. And then finally, in study four, um, we wanted to know just how good or accurate really does the algorithm need to be before people um, prefer it. Um, so we randomly assigned people to be in a condition of no information about past success at putting together a successful team that actually did solve the murder mystery. Um, or um, that the algorithm was 60% uh, successful at putting together um, teams, 75% or 90% of the time. And here um, we find that with no info, we replicate our effect of a preference for a person um, and that this weakens as the algorithm becomes more accurate, but the, the flip point here is the 75% an algorithm needs to be 75% before people actually prefer it relative to the hiring manager. <clears throat> so in summary, we find that 70% of applicants prefer to have a person review their application packet instead of an algorithm. Preference for person weakens when competition in the pool itself is higher. So not even related to anything about the um, decision maker, potential decision makers from the organization, and that people prefer an algorithm when, in hi when the hiring manager is a member of the out group, and it's driven more by expectations of random error um, rather than systematic error, which was pretty surprising to us. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that we run a number of follow-up studies to kind of dive into that and tease that out. Um, and then finally, an algorithm requires a pretty high benchmark of accuracy, 75%, before applicants prefer it to a person. Um, so here, it seems like when the domain is relevant to the self, people prefer human judgment. And when it's about the self, uh, we also ran three studies where we asked people, how do you want your teammates to be hired? Once we told them, you're hired for this murder mystery, now the, the um, choices, not how you're hired, but how you, the rest of your teammates are hired. And they still said the person, which I thought we might flip the effect there. So there might be a self other difference, um, but there wasn't. And then I have a, another project that's a lot more nascent where we do have, I think of maybe five studies where people are responding to feedback on their performance. So rather than an assessment that leads them to um, achieve a role on a team or not, just feedback on their writing. And there, people say they want feedback on their writing from a person, but when they actually get feedback 
it doesn't matter if it comes from an algorithm or a person, they still, everyone kind of updates to that feedback that they received. So I would say that that evidence is a little bit, um, it deserves a little bit more time to kind of sort through and understand. But my takeaway just from our data so far on this uh, judgment type of feedback is that people kind of say one thing, but then when push comes to shove and they're actually updating their beliefs, they do something different. So I've started a new project to dive into that, comparing how people respond to judgments of algorithmic and human advice based on if it's in the judge advisor system where they actually see the advice and update um, as much or as little as they want to it versus if they're in a scenario domain and they're choosing between advisors. And you can imagine in a scenario domain, the psychologically the psycho psychologically rich mechanism there would be that um, in a scenario, you can imagine all the different types of ways that advice might um, basically differ between an algorithm and a person, but in the judge advisor system, you are seeing the source with numeric information in front of you. So you're already attending to that advice, but in the scenario condition, your mind could come up with all these different ways that the advice might differ between the sources. And so there we found algorithm appreciation in judge advisor conditions, but in the scenario conditions, people seem, um, the, the data is noisy and people seem to be a little bit, um, we don't, we don't find out an inversion in the scenario, which is what I thought we'd find. We find kind of like a little bit of a difference there. Um, so I think there's some interesting moderators to look at here and I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well. Um, if there's any questions here, I'd love to take them and then I can go on to kind of another project I've been working on recently and developing this theory of machine. Uh, we actually have one question from Victor. So he asked about whether uh, were the accuracy levels actually measured or just made up information. So I guess it's yeah. a question about deception. Yeah. yeah, so we did use deception there as well. Um, I, in terms of efficiency, it just made more sense to change the label of how accurate it was. But I think it could be really fun to potentially run a field study where uh, companies like testing algorithmic judgment um, and giving people the accuracy feedback like real time. But this was just a way where we could actually test uh, more conditions that way. Great question. Any others? Um, another question from Taha, uh, he or she is wondering uh, how the wording and the content of the introduction of the algorithm to subjects matter. So how did you introduce uh, algorithms? Great question. I'm wondering if I can go to the slide without it messing up the slide deck. So we operationalize algorithm in algorithm appreciation in a few ways. And I'm hoping, hmm, I might need to stop sharing my screen to share this. Um, okay. Can you see this? So can you see regardless of the type? Great. Yes. Um, so in algorithm appreciation, we tested a few different operationalizations of the term algorithm itself um, because we had a, a similar question. Does it matter how we're describing the algorithm? Um, I was most intrigued by testing how people responded to advice they thought was coming from a black box algorithm. Mostly that's just because that's how our algorithmic advice is normally produced. We don't know the actual um, mathematics behind Netflix algorithm or you know Pandora's algorithm or dating apps algorithm. I don't know if anyone's seen recently on Netflix, when you tile through, I think it happened in the last week, when you tile through uh, movies that you want to view trailers for, um, they actually have one big screen that comes up that's a, like a random choice. And it, sa it says something like, do you want our algorithm to choose for you? Um, which is kind of, uh, I thought funny, but even there it's still a black box where we don't really know the data that's being input into the algorithm. We don't know how it's being processed. 
Um, so our results and algorithm appreciation hold regardless of the type of the algorithm that we presented. So we had started off describing a simple algorithm and we had used an average in algorithm appreciation. We didn't use any deception and we averaged between 300 to 400 um, separate participants to create the advice. So that allowed us to present advice that came from other people, but we could also um, frame it as coming from an algorithm because an average is really this one of the simplest algorithms. Um, so there we found algorithm appreciation. And then we went to a black box where we just changed the label, which is um, study four, the, the national security one. That's partly why it's one of my favorite studies because we just didn't give any information which allowed people to rely on their lay perceptions, like what whatever definition they were bringing to the table. And, and one question that you might have um, if you're asking this great question is that um, another one that normally comes up is, well, what do people think an algorithm is? Like, do our participants know what an algorithm means? And we asked in a number of our studies if people could define the term algorithm. And then we had our race code those responses um, to create categories. And normally the responses fall into categories of it's some sort of math or formula. Um, it's a rule, kind of like a some sort of rule based on logic, um, or there was a kind of miscellaneous character um, category, which was people kind of mentioning computers. And my takeaway from that is mathematicians and computer scientists wouldn't be upset to read those definitions. People have a pretty good idea of what an algorithm means. So if we give them the kind of black box operationalization, it's not that they don't know what we're talking about. Great question. Thanks so much for asking that. Yeah. Taha, are you satisfied with the answer or do you have any follow up questions regarding? No, absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. So I will move, move on to the question of Alicia. So she wonders, like, do you have any intuition or findings concerning the mechanism? Why higher competition induced the people to choose the algorithm more often? Uh, yeah, so we asked a lot of open ended questions um, in these studies because it was kind of new territory for me because it wasn't predictions about the world. And we just wanted to hear directly from participants either how they would rationalize it or try to post hoc explain their decision. And they said they said some interesting things, which um, I think could even be potentially a follow up to this. Um, so some people had said like they didn't think so there were time constraints and people knew that a decision would be made. My fear was that if it's high competition, people want the algorithm because they want to, they don't want to wait 21 extra minutes for a person to go through the applications. Um, but they said things like, oh, I don't want to do that to Joe. So it, there, that was a little bit surprising because it was kind of empathy towards the hiring uh, manager that they didn't want to put them through that many application packets to review. Um, and so I think that there, people do have top of mind a matter of efficiency, but there wasn't a straightforward explanation that made me think of an experiment that I could directly follow up on with that. Um, but if you have ideas, I would love to hear them. Like what kind of mechanism do you think is going on there? So I didn't have something special in mind, but I think the efficiency part is already very interesting that you tell, okay, people might have an efficiency argument in there and they think, okay, it's just takes time from the hiring manager and it's better for us both if the, if the algorithm does it. So I think this is really interesting. I was just wondering whether you have any complementary findings, but thanks a lot for your answer. Thanks. Yeah. And if you think of um, any like potential new mechanisms to test, I would definitely be, please send an email. I'd be open to, to hearing that. Oh, sorry. Alicia, do you want to continue? Okay. Um, I guess, uh, do you have any other slides you want to show? Yeah. Um, are, when is, are we over at 1030 or 11? Uh, I think we end at 11, but uh, after that, do you have like 20 or 30 minutes to have a, like a brief talk yep, with? Definitely. I actually was trying to save some time so we could have kind of a more open-ended discussion here. 
Um, yes. So maybe you first finish your slides and then we open the official Q&A session. Okay. Great. 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 Can you um, see these slides, the chapter? Great. Yes. Um, so throughout the course of um, both of these uh, research projects, I was kind of really just trying to figure out any moderators I could. Uh, especially because in algorithm appreciation, we never really flipped the effect to algorithm aversion. In algorithmic hiring, we we were able to flip the effect, um, and I think that that pr project deserves. Uh, we're definitely going to spend more time kind of digging up mechanisms, but I think we're focusing on the in-group, out-group, and the systematic versus um, random error. Um, but throughout all of that, I really wanted to create a framework to kind of fit not only the kind of data that I have, the evidence I have, but evidence that Berkeley has from his work, Berkeley Jet Forest, and Nate Fast had from his work. Um, and Adam Waits has some really lovely work that's, that's definitely relevant here. Um, and so I started thinking, well, we're really just looking at how do people think, what their lay perceptions and expectations of what algorithmic judgment can produce in terms of accuracy compared to human judgment. And as I was thinking through that, I thought I had a different graphic here. Oh, um, so from the dissertation, I kind of created this theoretical framework um, to help kind of make my research more systematic, but hopefully it could also be useful for um, other scholars who are interested in this area. Um, so the idea for this framework is that the research related to this um, would document how people expect human and algorithmic judgment to differ in their input and their process and their output. And so most of algorithm appreciation really focused on how are people responding to the output. And I really just think that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, with algorithmic hiring and people thinking about systematic versus random error, uh, I think that that does dive in a little bit more to process. And um, getting back to Alicia's comment um, about what might be the mechanism between the high and low competition, I actually think there, if we turn to looking at people's expectations of the input to algorithmic and human judgment when there's a lot of data versus a small amount of data and how that influences the judgments overall, I think that's where we'll really start to leverage um, people's expectations for what the algorithmic human judgment can handle in terms of um, data that it can it can use as input. Um, so uh, one thing that I was kind of interested in was just kind of creating some predictions of what I thought could be going on here, just from what I was learning from my own evidence uh, in, in my research. And so you can imagine that th this, these are basically predictions that I have for people's lay perceptions and expectations of algorithmic and human judgment, like at their finest, what they can get us. So you can imagine that people have assumptions that an algorithm utilizes data that is less nuanced or um, it's less, um, it's less abstract categorical and the algorithms can't utilize data that's more subjective or intangible and i think nate in his paper had talked about kind of like holistic assessment um which i think very much relates to this but whenever i ask my undergrads well how would you want to be hired when you're on the job market they say oh, i don't want an algorithm hiring me because they don't understand the special they they i will translate this from what they say but basically they make an argument like the algorithm won't understand how special a snowflake I am really, um, because I have a really wonderful personality and humor and all these things. And maybe they list things that aren't even related to the job performance, right? But I think people have this assumption that there's certain input that an algorithm can't attend to as well as a human. And I think that's, that's definitely a worthwhile question to test. And so in terms of quantity, I could imagine, I alluded to it earlier, that algorithm, people expect algorithms, people utilize larger amounts of data as input. So that's a little bit separate from the efficiency argument and it'd be kind of interesting to disentangle that as well. Um, and so in terms of process for people's expectations of quality and, and quantity, 
um, I'm predicting that people might uh, think that algorithms process less holistically without taking broader patterns or even context into account. And then in terms of quantity, algorithms process fewer categories of cues. So they might be able to um, take into account your scores on an anagram or trivia test, but that is a numeric score on an objective outcome. And I would consider maybe that one category. And when you talk to students who are in the midst of their recruiting process, they talk about all these other types of categories of cues, like being able to get along on a team. That's a totally separate category. And so people might see algorithms as processing fewer categories of cues. So they can focus on the objective criteria, but there's other categories out there that they might not be able to consider. And then finally, um, uh, with output, people might expect that algorithms can't provide an explanation behind their judgments, um, which ends up making them less persuasive. Um, and algorithm, they might expect that algorithms produce less relevant data to an individual. So this idea of the special snowflake versus um, kind of a recommendation for the average person. So people might have the idea that um, recommendations for things that people like uh, where I might think I have quirky preferences in music, um, but the algorithm can predict that everyone on average kind of likes Taylor Swift, but I'm special and I have unique taste. And then uh, finally, people might also expect that algorithms produce less output at a, at a time. So people can provide information and an explanation and they might not expect an algorithm kind of separate from what's actually out there in the real world, right? But people might not expect an algorithm to have a conversation with them about, say, a medical diagnosis where maybe an algorithm could diagnose them, but if they want to ask follow-up questions, they might feel more comfortable with the person. And so I've kind of taken this framework of theory of machine and, and tried to expand it even more, actually. So not just thinking about input process and output in this book chapter I wrote, um, it's, it's currently under review, but I'm, I'm happy to share it if anyone is interested and if there might be at least one person who reads a, a book chapter, that would be uh, great. I'd love to have a discussion about it. Um, I'm interested in kind of overlaying this input process output framework with, is the decision or judgment in the context of making a prediction or is it an assessment? So there you have things um, related to algorithmic hiring and, and feedback, I think even draws in, you have different goals than you would have of making a, a prediction, right? So feedback, you might also want motivation. You might want to know that the feedback is giving um, useful information that is actually actionable so that people can make progress. Um, and I think that if you can kind of create a matrix of input process output, people's expectations for this relative to if they're in these different domains. Um, well, I kind of came up with predictions that I thought might be interesting and wrote them up in this, this chapter. And then the last thing I'll say, uh, I'm hoping that this framework, um, especially in an area where there's been more and more attention over, I've seen the last five, six years or so, um, hopefully this can also help us systematically bring different individual researchers evidence and place it into um, a more formal kind of matrix of how they might reconcile and, and fit together so that we do have an overarching theory of machine that people are really kind of currently building. So just lay people out in the world, the more that we experience output from data analytics and um, recommendations from algorithms, financial, um, any any recommendation that could be made, almost, there's algorithms being built to try to make that recommendation. And I think the more in the real world we're coming into contact with the this new source of advice, we're actually in a really exciting time in human history where lay people are developing their theory of machine. Um, and my kind of last plug for this chapter is I've been thinking a lot about um, some fun discussions I've had with computer scientists. So like one day in the before times, one day I would talk to um, C-suite individuals uh, in exec ed and they would say, oh, could you tell me the five questions I should ask my data analytics team? And I thought 
I'm not at Coca Cola. Like, I, I don't know the context to be able to tell you five general questions you should ask. Context does matter. Um, and they wanted to know how they could communicate with their data analytics team and computer scientists more, how they could communicate more clearly. But then a month later, I would go over to the computer science department and talk, uh, give a talk on algorithm appreciation with computer scientists. And they were a little bit more hesitant to come out and say this, but they would basically um, tell me that they wanted to know how they could more clearly share the results that they were getting from their analyses. And they wanted to make sure that people would, would actually listen to this. So we have siloed in organizations, which ends up becoming reflected in silos on university campuses where there's the decision makers who want to know the questions to ask the analytics teams. And then there's the analytic teams that want to know um, what verbiage is most clear so that people will understand their output and then the decision makers will actually act on that. So I've seen kind of a disconnect of producing analytics versus acting on them. And oftentimes, um, not to generalize too much, but oftentimes people who are producing the analytics just kind of end there, right? They're not looking to see, well, is anyone acting on the analytics I've shared with them? Like, is this changing decision making? And that's where I think um, behavioral sciences and psychologists, uh, especially in the business school, I'm in a management department, we're in a really great, we're, we're poised really well to kind of pull together computer science, human computer interaction and psychology and think about, well, how do people actually respond to algorithmic versus human judgment? How do we solve this last mile problem of the analytics and data being there, but how to make it actionable? And so I started thinking about um, this kind of last part of the chapter. Um, every step of actually creating an algorithm requires a decision. And wherever there's a decision, psychology can say something about that, which is actually pretty fun. So in the stage of preparing to build the algorithm, um, computer scientists should be asking, like, is this data relevant to the prediction I'm making or the decision or judgment I'm trying to make? Is it biased in any way? So um, Amazon was using 500 models in their hiring algorithm to um, make their hiring more efficient. And they basically, a few years ago, walked away from that because they were finding that they were only hiring males and not hiring females. Uh, but I, I wrote an HBR on this that they kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater there because when you just walk away from the models you've developed to predict who will be a good performer, well, when you throw that out, what's left? You're reverting back to human judgment, which we know is riddled with biases. Um, and I would say the thing that we learned from Amazon fail, Amazon's failure a few years back is that we actually uncovered the verbiage in resumes that led an algorithm to hire those people. So um, yes, the output was biased because the input was historically, the historic data was biased. Um, their past hiring managers were hiring more men than women. One, that's useful to flag. You shouldn't just throw the baby out with the bathwater in an attempt to kind of distance yourself from that bias. You should, what I kind of make the argument for in that paper, it's kind of a thought piece in HBR is, we can use algorithms as magnifying glasses. And when you're at the step of preparing to build an algorithm, um, what Amazon ended up learning from this was um, the resumes that were more likely to get hired were resumes that used words like, I captured value um, and other kind of confidence laden words that also were very close to kind of like warfare terms. And though that confidence laden language was directly correlated, strongly correlated with um, gender. So I tell my students, use these words, <laughs> um, make the playing field a little more uh, even keel. But Amazon, I mean, they haven't given up on algorithmic hiring. They're, they're back to it, especially now with COVID. Um, but what Amazon could do if they wanted to use those same models is redact words um, adjectives that have really little to no um, predictive value in terms of people's performance. So you can, any time you are making decisions about input that you want to use for your algorithm, 
I think what we already know from um, different lines of psychological literature, we can apply to that um, and even ask new questions too and building the algorithm. So I think it's important to think about who is actually building the algorithm. If it's mostly males building hiring algorithm, it shouldn't be surprising that mostly males are getting hired. Once you have my, more diversity in the actual team that's building the algorithm, more um, women, a more culturally diverse set of people, you are also going to help um, think of questions that maybe someone from a certain perspective might not have considered before, right? Um, and then interpreting output from the algorithm. I think one of the hot topics that's just going to keep growing is auditing algorithms. And, and that's not to say that auditing should only happen once the algorithm is built. I think the whole point of, of auditing is you're going through a process before you actually launch this algorithm and start to use its judgments. But all of those steps are, I think, really right to ask new empirical research questions. So as industry is kind of grappling with that, I think that's an opportunity for researchers and academics to also ask those questions and test them um, rigorously. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to, to hearing your thoughts.